morning and a very warm welcome on behalf of the FBA Diabetes Platform to this online discussion where we will seek to understand diabetes, rethink diabetes and share solutions and try to answer the question, are we doing the best we can for the 60 million Europeans living with diabetes? My name is Jackie Davis. I'll be moderating this interactive discussion, which could not be more timely, coming as it does in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is prompting a shift in the policy agenda and a renewed interest in healthcare. As I say, it's going to be an entirely interactive discussion. I'm going to ask our distinguished panel some questions. I'll introduce them a bit later on. And then I hope we will also hear some questions from you uh, as we consider whether it is time to rethink how diabetes care is delivered and ensure that all those who need to be involved work together to improve its diagnosis, treatment and management. So if you want to join our conversation later on and ask a question, there are two ways you can do it. You are all muted for now. If you would like to ask a question orally, click on the little raised hand button and I will give you the floor and unmute your mic when the time comes. If you prefer to write your question, uh, use please the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, not the chat box, the Q&A box for questions, please. And could I ask you to keep your questions relatively brief so I can see at a glance what your question is and who it is for. May I suggest Twitter length or less would be perfect. If you're having any IT issues, problems, and you need the help of our wonderful wizards behind the screen, please use the chat box for that. Last housekeeping point, the Twitter hashtag. If you would like to share with the outside world what you're hearing here, and we do encourage you to do that to get the diabetes message out, the hashtag is behind the scenes with diabetes. So, before I introduce our panel, we're going to start with a very short video just to set some context for our discussion. So let's watch that video. Ladies and gentlemen, underlining there the impact of the disease, uh, the difficulties, the challenges faced by those who live with diabetes and calling for innovations and an integrated healthcare approach to deliver better outcomes. I'm going to discuss all of that with our panel. Let me introduce them. And as I do, I hope you will uh, see them appear magically on your screen. John Bowis, uh, who is a former member of both the British and the European parliaments uh, and is a patient advocate now uh, for diabetes. John, great to have you with us. A very warm welcome. Kaiser Lindbergh, global health consultant and international diabetes forum Europe advocacy, uh, sorry, advocacy advisor. Uh, a very warm welcome to you, Kaiser, and hopefully we will see you in just a second. Hello there. Uh, and Sirba Pitikainen, MEP, who is a member of the European Parliament's Committees on Economic and Monetary Affairs and Women's Rights and Gender Equality, and an active member of the Parliament's former interest group on diabetes. I believe there are moves to have another one, uh, but very active in this area. And Stefan Schreck, Head of Health Programme and Chronic Disease Unit uh, in the European Commission's Directorate General for Health and Food Safety, better known, of course, in Brussels um, as uh, DG Sante. Uh, Stefan, um, we were having a few technical problems earlier. Can you now hear and see us? Not yet, but hopefully we will get this sorted uh, in a moment. So let us get underway. And as I say, no opening statements, no remarks. We're just going to jump in. Uh, and I have uh, some questions for the panel, and then I'll say, please do bring your questions 
through the Q&A button or the raised hands. John, perhaps if I could start with you. We saw there in the video, that's frankly, for me, staggering statistic, that the current size of the diabetes population in Europe is equivalent to the population of Italy. And I also read a statistic that it kills more people than road accidents every year across Europe. Given all of that, do you think diabetes is getting adequate attention? Are we, are we giving this the priority that we need to? And if we're not, why not? It seems self-evident, it's vital to tackle it. Yes, Jackie, I, I mean, those figures are, are, are mind-blowing in a way, but I actually don't think they're the full picture. Uh, I suspect uh, you could double that figure because of the number of people who are not identified as living with diabetes. Uh, and um, that is a problem. Uh, I think, in, in general, over the recent years, we've got more attention paid to diabetes, not least in the, in the Commission and the Parliament. Uh, and, but I think um, COVID-19 has blown us off course. There's been a lot of reference to diabetes as one of the uh, triggers or, or the worseners mm. uh, of uh, the, the, the problem, the health problem. Uh, but uh, I know from my own experience that uh, a lot of our diabetes um, attention has been put on hold. Our, our specialists have been postponing the clinics. Um, the uh, tests and uh, scans and so on um, are not taking place. So I think it's a mixed message. And I think we need to look both at the uh, how we can um, t scan people in advance to find those who really are living with this uh, disease uh, and also to um, uh, help us as we want to uh, in managing our own um, health, uh, and we can go into all, all that, how that can be done. Uh, and also, because again, my own experience of living with other things as well, including heart bypass, lymphedema, and so on, I, I want a system which takes account of all those yeah. and doesn't live in silos, as, as too often is the case. Mm -hmm. Hence that emphasis on an integrated approach and, and the complexity of this condition and associated. But as you say, and Kaiser, very striking, COVID-19, we have heard a lot of references to people living with diabetes being a particularly vulnerable group. And therefore, as, as COVID-19 has pushed this issue, the whole, the whole of the health agenda uh, up and, and front and centre, you would think there would be more attention. And yet diabetes does seem to often be forgotten or neglected. For you, why do you think that is? I, I think it's, it's an Sorry, sorry it's, no, it's to Kaiser. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's something that's been going on for years. Uh, it's this misconception about diabetes, right? Uh, there's simultaneously a lack of knowledge about diabetes, but also a perceived knowledge. People's, there are a lot of things that people don't have knowledge about, but diabetes is one where they think they do have knowledge about it. There's this dual sort of uh, situation where they don't have knowledge, but they think they do. And that, I think, complicates the situation. Um, and I think it, as well, what always plays in in this is this perceived idea that you've caused this yourself. You you caused your own diabetes. Therefore, you know why would I why would I spend money on research for you? Why would I give you any sort of uh, empathy when you've caused this yourself? And I think that's been highlighted by uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic for sure. Absolutely. So it is that sense of of well, as you caused it yourself, this shouldn't be a priority for us because you did it. So how do you tackle that, Sipa? And can you put your camera on for us, Sipa, if possible? And your microphone is currently muted. So if you could unmute yourself. Um, for you, um, both our first speakers there highlighting the degree to which it is not getting the attention it deserves, and indeed is being, as John put it, blown off course by. COVID-19, how do you see the challenge, and particularly from the perspective of a policymaker, you know, very actively involved in this area? Why, why does this disease, is it because, I hate to use the word, but is it because it's not sexy enough for people, or is it, do you think, because of Kaiser's point about people say, well, you brought it on yourself, so uh, why should we, what, sorry, that's an exaggeration, but, but it give, makes people feel it's less important to pay attention to it. Do you think that's the cause? Well, I think that there are several causes. Uh, there's still the stigma that, okay, uh, it might be your uh, uh, habits if you eat wrong food, so you don't exercise enough. So um, why don't you sort of get a grip of yourself? 
then uh, the diabetes, as uh, we all know, used to be very deadly disease before we got any medication. And then sort of after the medication, I think that our sort of a, a heads turned around and thought, okay, this is a problem that you took care of. You can always uh, put the metformin or whatever is the medication and you don't die, drop dead immediately anymore. And so it was uh, seen as an as, uh, issue taken care of already, like the, uh, 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 like the first, uh, the, the type one or the, the type two. Then the uh, second is that it might be a bit old fashioned, you know, we talk about the uh, non-communicable diseases and there's a lot of new research and talk about memory disabling diseases and others as they should. And now what I'm looking for is this new upraise and understanding that you do not have diabetes, as we know, but there are at least 40 different types of diabetes. There's the understanding of the uh, genetics that uh, there's a, a higher risk and actually quite the multitude what is thought to be type 2 diabetes is actually this kind of a gene uh, uh, in, induced uh, uh, metabolic disorders or mo uh, 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 mod 1 or 2 types diabetes or whatever. So we need to have this understanding and more this kind of a, uh, 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 this kind of a uh, more detailed understanding and then how Absolutely. you treat it and how, how uh, whatever also, you, as you uh, say, do. thank you. What are the problems it can lead to, um, to, to understand why it's so important to address it? I think we have Stefan. Stefan, can you hear me? I can see you. Can you hear me now? Uh, your mic is off. So if you could try to activate your mic. Um, hang on a second. Can you Actually, I think uh, I'm still under Stefan's name and I see Melda uh, and other participants. So if oh, someone sorry. changed the name, you named the wrong Stefan. Okay, <laughs> doesn't, that doesn't matter, but Stefan, on with the wrong name uh, next year, can you hear me? Not at the moment, or you can't speak. Actually, I'm, I'm now texting with Stefan. I think his microphone does not work, but I think he can hear you. Okay, but unfortunately at the moment I can't speak to him. So hopefully he's listening into our conversation and I can come back to him in a little while when we solve the problem uh, of not being able to hear him. Uh, but let's, let's continue. So coming, coming then to what do we need to do about this? For each of you, and Kaiser, maybe this time I could start with you, in terms of what's the key challenge here? What do we need to do? You've all emphasized a lot the narrative how we talk about diabetes, what we know about diabetes. You've mentioned, and John was mentioning this important, it's a complex condition, it's difficult, therefore this need for an integrated approach. What do you see as the most important challenges we need to tackle? And then we'll talk about who needs to do what in order to do that. But what for you is, are, are the most important challenges? Well, I think uh, to answer your, your first question there, does diabetes get enough attention or is it a, a priority enough? And I think the simple answer to that would be no. As someone living with diabetes and, and living with type 1 diabetes for 18 years and as someone working with it, the simple answer is no. But, but it's also a complex issue. And I think we need to realize where we are in the situation, in the health space situation. So we're not a single disease just existing, needing attention. We're, we're within this whole complex system of other diseases also getting attention. I'm living with six other um, chronic diseases apart from, from diabetes. And within each of those patient groups, they all think they're not getting enough attention. They all think that they need to be a higher priority. So we need to realize that we're not uh, within a vacuum. We need to sort of relate to these other diseases and perhaps work together with them. Um, I'm a big believer in working within the NCD space, the non-communicable disease space. So working with other diseases that have similar, um, similar risk factors, for example, or other uh, similarities to diabetes. But um, one thing, being a patient advocate, one thing I think is definitely needed to move forward is, is realizing that patients are a resource, using the voices and the competence and the experience of people living with diabetes in this case, using them as a resource in this fight. Um, it's getting, we're getting there slowly, um, but patients are still a massively, uh, massively undervalued uh, resource. So I definitely think um, we need to start using people living with diabetes as a, as a bigger resource. 
So that 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 being absolutely central, John, for you, and then CFR, I'll come to you from a policymaker perspective. But as someone who's been a policymaker and is now a patient advocate, so you've, if you like, been on both sides of this equation. Um, how do you see the challenge ahead? Is the challenge uh, in terms of of the narrative that we've been talking about quite a lot? Is it in terms of the way this integrated approach to, to the care that you talked about? What what are the central challenges for you? Look, I think the, um, uh, the the essential things we need to do, firstly, in terms of um, uh, people not being seen because their their cases have been delayed, postponed, uh, is to uh, both ensure that uh, hospital-based doctors and specialists uh, do pay us that that attention and do go continue with our scans and um, tests and so forth. That I may say has begun to happen with my case with my, with my heart um, bypass. I have had a scan on that. Uh, but the follow-up and my, my diabetes specialist, I'm told they'll both be on by phone uh, in a month's time uh, and not even by Zoom, but by phone. Now that's not uh, reassuring to me. Uh, similarly, I think uh, a number of people have been, uh, well, a lot of people have been put off going to hospital because of apprehension about are they, is it a safe place to be going? And I think that is something that needs to be overcome and that needs a lot more uh, uh, emphasis from, from policymakers and from practitioners and managers and so forth. But I think then the, uh, we, the key, because we, we know the numbers are growing, uh, we th I think the numbers are also hidden. Uh, so we need to harness all the resources we have. And one of the key resources is the expertise that comes from being a patient. Uh, and I, I maintain that a patient is as much an expert as the scientist and the practitioner. They all need to work together. Uh, and patients, uh, certainly, I, my, in my case, I could confirm that uh, I'm more than willing to do more to manage my, my own health problems if, if I'm taught how, I'm told how. And that exactly. means uh, using digital health, e-health, uh, in, in a way that uh, gets me um, working and with reassurance that there's distance monitoring if, if I fail to do things Absolutely. properly or... So that key role, as you say, for digital health, for collecting the data, for being able to analyze it. Stefan, I am told that not only can we see you but, and you can hear us, but maybe you may be able to speak to us now. Is that possible? Next test. We can yes. try. Fantastic. I can hear you beautifully. Uh, very warm welcome. Sorry for all the stresses and strains of joining us. But I believe, Stefan, you've been listening uh, to the conversation so far. Um, and I really just want to come back on, on this question to you uh, as a policymaker of, of the priority and the attention that, that diabetes gets. We saw in the video at the beginning just how we call it often Europe's silent health pandemic. We know diagnosis rates are growing very fast. If it's not getting the attention it deserves, would you accept that? And if so, what do you think the challenge is here? Yeah, you know, the, the Commission is committed to the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, in, in particular, Goal 3.4 on reducing mortality from NCDs. And um, according to our role, we are supporting member states in their efforts to reach the Sustainable Development Goal, uh, as well as the more specific NCD targets set by the World Health Organization. And um, what we are doing is actually we are taking a horizontal approach to NCDs. This enables us to address cross-cutting risk factors as well as challenges in the areas of treatment and care. And um, to maximize our joint efforts with member states, the steering group on health promotion, disease prevention and management of NCDs selects and supports best practice implementation in order to tackle the common challenges as regards NCDs. Uh, this approach does in no way imply that specific diseases such as diabetes do not receive attention, but actually we are taking our lead uh, from member states' priority setting. In the past few years, this has already resulted in prioritization of uh, work on is issues such as obesity, mental health and rare diseases. Uh, and also, of course, via the health program, we have supported various projects that are relevant to the fight against diabetes. There were, for example, the two joint actions on chronic diseases, uh, CRODIS 1 and 2. And uh, one of the main outcomes of the first one, which ran until 2017, included dedicated work on prevention and management of diabetes and also national diabetes policy on multimorbidity and on patients' needs. Uh, and this is taken forward in the ongoing CRODIS Plus joint action that addresses health promotion 
quality of care and sustainable access to employment. Uh, there's also a project that was supported which focused on innovative prevention strategies for type 2, uh, type two diabetes in South Asians living in Europe that ended two years ago uh, because there is uh, the South uh, Asian population in Europe is at considerable risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Um, and also um, in the area of research, uh, 1.2 billion of EU funding was invested in diabetes research in projects covering areas such as biomarkers, new treatments and telemedicines. The ongoing Horizon 2020 work program for 2019 and 2020 supports diabetes research through key priorities such as new therapies for NCDs, understanding causative mechanisms in multimorbidities implementation research for maternal and child health and also regenerative medicine. So uh, indeed you cannot really say that uh, diabetes does not receive um, sufficient intention, attention at European level because actually quite a lot happened in recent years. And it may be as you say you're pointing out it's in lots of different areas and lots of different actions not all maybe the perception comes slightly from you have it's there's a, there's a wide range of areas where it comes in. So I'd be interested to know, though, Sirpa, if I could bring you in here and perhaps you could put your camera back on for us. Um, in terms of when people like John and Kaiser talk to you as a policymaker and they talk about diabetes and they talk about what they want you to do, is it clear enough to you? Are, are the calls for action, as it were, clear enough? Do you know? what they really want uh, or is it is the message i'm wondering whether part of the problem we'll come back to the misperception in the public later but for policymakers, is it clear are they clear enough in their specific demands this is how you can help address these issues or what would your advice be to them as a recipient of their messages as it were well uh personally uh, uh i benefited with these contacts with patient organizations uh, uh, researchers and pharmaceuticals and I think that the message is very loud and clear if you are in this kind of a networks like the diabetes network in the European Parliament but in the case that you are not on that network uh, the risk is that you do not get all that uh, beneficial information and that's why our task in the Parliament is to try to broaden this network as as big as possible and I second very strongly this cooperation with the other NCDs because we know there's a lot of same route in, uh, in, in the diseases, there's a lot of comorbidity and uh, so we could strengthen uh, and uh, the same kind of patient interests like uh, using better uh, patient knowledge, better mobile and e-health uh, applications and uh, uh, the two things that I hope that uh, the patients could be stronger and the movement altogether is that we would require global, EU and national diabetes programs or NCD programs. And then, and I know this is very, very sensitive, it is, can we touch the foods? And we know that the kids are eating too much sugars and they are the hidden sugars. And this is one uh, risk that actually doesn't cause the diabetes, we know, but it is this kind of accelerator factor and so if we can't do on what we sell uh, uh, anything about the fact what we are selling uh, in our shops and uh, uh, serving as food in schools and so on, we cannot actually tackle this uh, challenge uh, either. And as mm. you know, I'm not tackling chocolates right now, but the hidden sugars in ketchups and uh, in salad dressings and whatever that is. Absolutely. Uh, just John, you wanted to come in and please a reaction to what Stefan was saying, really disputing the notion that diabetes is neglected. Yes, uh, well first of all, something Serpa was saying, uh, and I so much agree with her, that we need to tackle the uh, um, children and get, get hold of their minds and their intelligence uh, in terms of learning about what foodstuffs are good and what are less good. Uh, and I always believe that through children you can reach parents and if uh, once we get the education system working in terms of explaining what uh, diabetes and other diseases are, um, then that will filter through or cascade down or cascade up in this case. Uh, I think in terms of, of Stefan's points, I, I, mean, I very much agree with him on the, uh, um, the, the uh, prevalence 
uh, and he mentioned the South Asian. Well, I think you start actually with the African Caribbean communities where it's three times more likely that uh, they will develop diabetes. And in South Asia, it's six times more likely. So there is clear a directional message there as to where we should be looking to support communities, communities within communities, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and it, it, he also mentioned the, um, the comorbidities, uh, and I, I think he touched I, I, uh, briefly on, and I think it is very important, on the mental health side, because undoubtedly diseases like diabetes, like heart disease, like cancers, like all, all any other uh, such diseases, bear, carry with them a burden of mental health problem. Uh, and we do need to look at the, uh, the mental health of people at the same time we're looking at their, their physical health. And if we yeah. have a program, national ca campaigns, European-wide campaigns, to look at uh, that, uh, and we can do it under the Treaty of Amsterdam with its um, competence that we now have for uh, health promotion, uh, uh, then we can make a difference uh, across the board. And I was struck, I mean, talking about that mental health issue, reading that uh, someone with diabetes makes something like 180 decisions a day that are affected by their condition. I found that quite staggering on the level of stress and anxiety that that can potentially cause. But Stefan, I want to come in a moment to involving, you talked about the voice of the patients and two of you here are, are speaking for the patients and we have a question about involvement of, of people with diabetes. But Stefan, before that, a question I asked others earlier, accepting much more is being done than maybe people realize. Um, what for you is the key challenge now to really make progress on improving the situation for people living with diabetes, diagnosis, treatment, and so on, and, and really achieving better outcomes. What's the challenge now for you? Well, um, I, I think maybe on that I should first mention something that uh, maybe is, was not addressed by your discussion so far. Uh, you, you might have noticed that the Commission, uh, following the outbreak of the uh, corona pandemic, actually uh, submitted a proposal for a new health program, a self-standing, much larger health program than ever before, the EU for Health program, with a budget of more than 9 billion euros. And um, obviously, while this was triggered by the uh, COVID-19 situation, without any doubt, it would also have allowed uh, much more investment in non-communicable diseases, including diabetes. But then you might also have noticed that actually the heads of state and government, the European Council in their last meeting actually uh, agreed to cut the budget proposed by the Commission by more than 80 percent. So uh, let, let's say, um, uh, I would say everybody needs to think about uh, not only about the relative priorities of uh, separate diseases and health issues, but actually about the importance of health as a policy priority overall. Um, I, I, th I think that is really the key uh, challenge now from our perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and linking that, of course, I mean, there is an opportunity now because of COVID-19, because health is, is front and centre, it should be easier to do. And yet, as you say, we saw that big, big cut to the budget uh, at the summit in July. I know the Parliament is now fighting to restore some of that. We see where that goes. Um, there is a question here, and I want to link it to something uh, both John uh, and, and, and Siafa was talking about, and I think Kaiser as well, about involving, you talked about the experience of patients, and you consider, John, patients as expert uh, as, as the doctors, and it says, people with diabetes should be involved at all levels in the decision-making progress process. What can we done, do to speed that up? What's the key? And Kaiser, perhaps coming to you first, um, what's the key for you to making sure that the patient is at the heart of this and that expertise is used? So I think it's uh, the simple answer would be to just dive in there, to just go for it, take a risk as as an institution, as a policymaker, whatever forum you're, you're um, arranging to just do it. But what I also think is needed um, are, are um, examples of, of successful cases that can be used um, to sort of highlight the importance of doing this and the benefits of doing this. And, and as a patient and as a patient representative, what I think is needed for us we are experts on our disease. We're experts in terms of our experience, right? But a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times we might not be experts um, 
within the methodology of a of a of a of a policy um, or of a decision making process or of the European Parliament for that matter. Um, so what I think is needed is is sort of an uh, an educational platform or some kind of way of educating patients to be patient representatives to not only represent themselves but to also represent others living with the same disease to have that knowledge of the wider group uh, the data that shows what their disease is like what their needs are and also a knowledge of, of the processes to make you feel comfortable being a patient and being a patient expert i think that would and, and say for one for you, because it links to something you said about the different types of diabetes. Someone asking, type 1 diabetes is autoimmune, not related to diet. How do we ensure that in delivering these public health messages around type 2 diabetes or general be, uh, well-being, we do not demonize children with type 1 uh, and indeed adults with type 1? Um, so, so going back, and this comes back to this messaging and this misperception, and this, if you like, blame game that we've had so far. What do you think we should do from a communication point of view, whether you're policymakers, patient advocates, um, in order to, to help people to understand the differences and the different causes and roots? How, how do you see your role in helping to tackle those misperceptions? And any thoughts anybody else has on that? Uh, thank you for the raising the issue, because I think that this is extremely important. That's why I started with this one, that actually there's multitude uh, of diseases uh, that are actually very different kind of diseases, uh, 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 genetically inherited, that all goes under the label of diabetes. And some are more prone and more sen sensitive towards the diets, uh, some not. Some uh, should be treated early on and this tested and we should have the gene test all, already when you are uh, born. Uh, some ones uh, uh, react very well with the medication, some don't. And we should actually get all together and sort of try to describe the family. And I've been considering, um, and I would love to have your feedback, should we at all use this diabetes? Or should we call it as a syndrome or uh, should we uh, call it diabetes family or whatever, because I think that this is very important uh, uh, message that we do not uh, talk about one uh, disease because it is not and you need different kind of a medication, different kind of a support and uh, all that you, you know better than I do. Uh, if you have uh, type 1 or type 2 or uh, MODI or, or mitochondrial di diabetes or, or whatever and so now everything is happily mixed quite often. Absolutely. Any comments to that? How do we make the message clearer, easier to understand these different types? John? Yes, I mean, I, I think we have to get some people standing up. People who are recognized by the public, get standing up and saying, I do this, I'm an actor, I'm a, on your screens, television interview or whatever, and I'm living with diabetes. And the more I always felt when I was a policymaker that um, I had a duty to be open about uh, the conditions that I was living with. Because uh, I think that sometimes helps other people to uh, say me too, uh, and to discuss it. I also um, feel that uh, the, um, the, the mechanisms we use are the uh, consultations with our specialist. Mm. That should be a two-way um, conversation. And in my case, I have said always was and always is. Yeah. Uh, and we, we almost discuss the thing as, as friends uh, because he wants my input as well as I want his expertise. Uh, and that um, is, is really saying that uh, patients, people living with diabetes, type 1 or type 2, um, and I take, I take the point type 1 is very often young children, so it's more, more, more difficult, but they should be involved in decisions about their own uh, health and, and uh, diagnosis. They should also be involved in the planning of services. So it's a, it's a double double route for patient input. And how do we make that happen? Well, when I was that? when I was a minister, I I, I had a, a committee of of, of um, patients and users, users and carers, uh, and my officials didn't always like that very much because they they couldn't control it. But I loved it because um, I, I actually heard the reality from people with a range of different uh, conditions, disorders. Yeah. Stephen, I, I could take a decision on, on what I heard. 
to that point, and then I want to come to the issue of healthcare systems. But on that point, two points, the one about patient involvement, and John was saying as a minister, uh, he proactively pushed that even if it did annoy people, uh, but also to this, this um, how you frame the debate and the sense that people are putting too much of the burden on the patient because of perception it's their fault in some way. Do you see a role for you as a policymaker in addressing some of these misconceptions about diabetes? Well, uh, uh, on that, just one, one remark on communication. Of course, it's important to actually get the message over to all who take decisions uh, in, in terms of how diabetes is prevented and addressed as a disease. But actually, people also for their own sake should be educated about diabetes in order to be able to avoid it. And uh, that, that's a question of health literacy. And that is also something we have been addressing already with a project uh, already 10 years ago. And that is also something that should not be forgotten. And then uh, when it comes to patient involvement, uh, I mean, we, are, we fully agree that this is a very important element in actually designing policies. Um, and we have several mechanisms to involve patients. There's, for example, the possibility to receive operating grants under the health program. And several patient organizations actually receive such operating grants. And then we have established a new health policy platform, which is basically our own Sante uh, Facebook, where in interested stakeholders can actually uh, interact with themselves and, uh, for example, uh, join forces to uh, collect best practices or uh, establish position papers um, or um, provide collective feedback to initiatives of the commission. So a lot is actually be, being done already to support patients and their involvement. And also in other areas such as uh, what EMA is doing on the authorization of medicines, patients are involved as well. Thank you very much. Let's come to the question of healthcare systems. Oh, sorry, Kaiser, you wanted to come in. Well, I just wanted to highlight as well that, that one thing is about involving patients doing that as a, as a single act, but a, a perhaps equally important thing is how you do it. Um, it's one thing to involve someone um, in a situation, but how do you make sure that their voice is respected, that their voice is heard, that, it's, that it weighs equally to someone else's? I've been in a lot of settings where I have been a patient representative, but I've been alone in a room with 19 healthcare professionals. And how am I supposed to represent millions of people living with diabetes? Um, in a setting like that, where I'm it very much in a minority, where you would expect the patient's voice to be important, but, but really, in reality, it's still, it is at the table, but you're not an equal voice, you're not an equal partner in the discussion. So I just wanted to highlight that as well. It's, it's, it's very much about inviting patients, but it's also about what you do once they're invited. Thank you very much. Let's turn now to, uh, if we could, John, to the because there's a number of questions relating to this. I, I want to come back to this point about integrated care and the healthcare system generally, and whether we need to rethink uh, the way we approach this. Um, and, and you know, we're talking about resources as well. How do you make sure? CFA called earlier for uh, global, EU, and national programs to deal with this. And so how do we make sure? Is the general question that healthcare systems do the rethinking that's necessary, allocate the resource that's necessary in order to deliver, genuinely deliver this integrated approach and tackle the issue we've been discussing. But I have some specific questions to add to that from the audience. The revolution in type one diabetes and other types was the introduction of products such as insulin in pumps and continuous blood glucose monitoring. What can be done across Europe to make these products more accessible and affordable to health systems and patients. And another one, I've heard a little, little about innovations. So from Amsterdam to the policymakers, how can we ensure continuous monitoring for people at risk of developing diabetes or with the condition uh, is made more widely available? Reimbursement would make progress on prevention and treatment. Do you agree? Um, this whole question of, of some of these innovations and, and the issues around reimbursements and so on. Stefan, can you comment to that? Um, yes. So, uh, first of all, I should really say that uh, what we can do in the Commission depends on what the treaty says. Yeah, and as John was already referring to, there, there are very specific, um, very specific provisions. And one of them is that actually member states are in charge of organizing their health systems and also allocating resources within the health system. So that's indeed very specific. That's something where 
the Commission does not have a role. Of course, we are having a role in supporting information, in innovation, and that's what we are doing. I mean, uh, there's a lot of research which, which is being funded, and uh, of course, also the authorization of medicines are uh, in, indeed done by EMA. Um, but when it comes to allocation of resources and questions of reimbursement, for example, that's clearly responsibility of member states. Now, it is also clear that we are aware that a key challenge is not only to innovate, but actually to ensure access to that innovation to all those who need it. And um, uh, there are also discussions with member states are ongoing. Uh, we have seen now, as an example, um, due to the COVID-19 situation which we are having, that we were resorting to joint procurement, for example, um, of protective equipment, for example, of ventilators. Um, and uh, this, this is something which was never done this way at European level. And maybe then member states can also learn from that. But whatever the Commission does will be determined by what its role is according to the treaty. And there, the health systems are clearly attributed to member states and also the allocation of resources. Thank you. Any other comments to that before we move on? Sierpa, in terms of, of, of the importance here of, of innovation, supporting innovation, supporting accessibility and affordability, do you believe you as a politician, there is more we can do on that? Definitely, and this is of, uh, one of my favorite ideas, and a <clears throat> plea for the patient organizations also. <coughs> we would need to increase the EU competencies in the health area. And I'm a very, very strong advocate uh, about the EU for Health um, program and increasing the funding. And as you might know, there's a very strong statement on these lines from the parliament also, and this is very unanimous. And uh, it would be, uh, it, it really would need to be clear for, for patients and for the people that the way how we are doing it only in the member states doesn't guarantee the best possible care for all of the patients and for all of the different types of the diabetes. That's why I'm talking about the national programs. And actually what I really would like to see is that we would have reference centers for NCDs, not only for rare diseases, and a tighter cooperation. And that we would have, uh, in context of the referen uh, reference centers, a recommendation of the best practice of the care in different types of the diabetes uh, included. And that should include the future-oriented uh, uh, approach, like uh, in what time scale and frame you have the new uh, 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 technologies to, for uh, glucose monitoring or automatic uh, in injections or whatever uh, possibilities uh, uh, there are for new uh, uh, medication or treatment that yeah. is uh, speeding up very, very fastly. And I hope that we all could work uh, together uh, to, to push forward this. Striking, and I have a follow-up question for you, but striking that the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen uh, talked yesterday uh, about one of her new, you know, added priorities to the things we've talked about before, green deals and so on, was very much an emphasis on a stronger European health union. Um, maybe a, an issue for the Conference on the Future of Europe, watch this space. But there was a direct question to you in relation to the national level, Sirpa. Um, what regular contact do you have with national parliamentarians who can directly influence policies to prevent, encourage early diagnosis and ensure the best treatment for diabetes? Are there regular contracts between you and maybe John also with your experience of UK Parliament and European Parliament, are national and European politicians working well enough together on these issues? Well, uh, very briefly, yes, I have very regular contacts with patient organization in Europe, but also, uh, of course, especially in Finland. And what is the best experience, for example, these follow-up programs we, like we have in Finland, uh, the diabetes program and uh, how it should be developed. And I do have regular contacts with the researchers and universities to sort of keep up my understanding what we are talking about. And then, uh, of course, some other NGOs working and the parliamentarians, because they, indeed there's a diabetes working group in the Finnish parliament and uh, we'll change emails and talks, uh, let's say once or twice per year. Or I think the door is open if there's a message to be sent from one or to uh, or another direction. 
John? Yes, I, I think um, that the links between European Union uh, institutions and national institutions is, is very important. Uh, but I think we are limiting ourselves in this. Um, we, we did quite a lot when I was in the European Parliament about contacting our, our spokesmen and our ministers and so forth. Uh, that, was, that was fine. Um, and we managed uh, collectively with, with um, the international community to get uh, the UN to declare a World Diabetes Day. Each year. And that was another step forward in terms of making people aware of the problems. But, you know, we, we so often think that if we've convinced our health minister or health mm -hmm. spokesman, we've done the job. Uh, what we forget is that they have to battle with the, the rest of the um, cabinet or government or parliament uh, and it is trying to persuade the economics ministers, the treasury ministers, the prime ministers that this is important, that is so much without that what we do with health ministers is, is not futile but it's, it's difficult. Uh, it's, Maybe helped by that message in the video we watched at the beginning about the financial cost of all of this, 148 billion in 2019, they should be listening. They should, they, sh they should indeed be, uh, and so should, uh, if I may say so, um, Stefan, the, um, the European Union and the Commission, because you have a weapon that is not often used. You do have competence for the economic success, for wealth creation, and you cannot have wealth creation without health creation. And we can uh, tackle it the other way around in, in a stronger way, I believe, if we make it clear that uh, without good health, you cannot have good wealth, good economic progress. Uh, and so it is part of the economic policy to make sure that we uh, prevent disease, we manage disease quickly, and we support people in their return to economic activity. Kaiser, uh, two questions to you. First, in relation to the healthcare system and how to how to make sure this rethink, if you like, of the approach happens. Uh, what for you uh, are the key priorities? And then if I could move us on to, we've talked a lot about the role of patient groups and we've talked about the role of the policymaker and the politician. Uh, we haven't talked about the role of industry in all of this. And I did have a question here uh, from one member of the audience about the role of industry saying, um, how do you, what and how do you think pharmaceutical groups can do to help the life of those living with diabetes? So. Perhaps you could pick up on that point uh, and, and others who might want to touch on the role of industry here. Kaiser. Yes, well, I think, um, I think there's definitely a point in us talking about, di that was mentioned as, as one of the questions, talking about diabetes as, as one disease and as, um, as sort of a, a unified situation, right? But, um, what we need to remember is in all of this and within the healthcare system is that we're dealing with people, right? We're not dealing with the disease. We're dealing with people who are living with this disease. They are whole persons. And like you say, John, um, health equals wealth, right? Um, we can't just treat people's physical symptoms of, about diabetes. We have to treat them as a whole person. And that includes quality of life. That includes any kind of mental health issues. Diabetes is a physical disease, but it's very much one that impacts your mental health. So I think that's a key. We're, we're getting there, but it's still, it's, we're not even close to being um, at the finish line. So I think that's one of the things, having a person-centered, holistic approach to diabetes within the healthcare sector, uh, within the healthcare system. Um, um, and that includes, I mean... Just before you come to the other side of the equation, this, this does link very much to a a comment and a question from someone in the audience saying it's great if the parliament can bring up the overall health care of people to discuss if much more focus should be on that quality of life question uh, to promote increased welfare workforce education so can we do this more across member states so you're very much echoing uh, what each other and, and do you see a role there again to get for the EU to help get this focus on the quality of life issue? Sorry, is that me? Yeah, yeah. Just okay. picking up on the point you made about quality of life. How do we make sure this gets embedded more in the discussion? Yeah, well, I think as always, I think patients have a very strong voice and listening to what patients actually have to say, what matters to them is really important. And then as uh, in any kind of situation, having someone else speak on your behalf, I think is very powerful. 
But if we want policymakers and healthcare professionals, et cetera, et cetera, to speak on our behalf, they need to echo our message. They need to listen to what we want and not just bring forward their own ideas of what this means. So if patients are saying that quality of life is a, is a majorly important issue for us, also in terms of what we were talking about before, innovation, one of the main benefits of, uh, for example, a continuous glucose monitor is, yes, an improved A1C, but also an improved quality of life. Um, so I think listening to patients and echoing their message is, is um, important. And the role of it just coming, and I'd like a thought from all of you on the role of, of, of pharmaceutical companies in this, the role of industry in this, presumably, number one, in delivering those innovations, uh, which, as you say, can make such a huge difference. Um, but how do you see their role? What do you want to see from them? Same question to you all. Yeah. Shall I start on that? Please, please. Um, I, I think one of the good things that's come out of the COVID-19 experience is the willingness of um, pharmaceutical companies to work collaboratively. Uh, that is not always the case. Uh, very often they're in, uh, not surprisingly, great competition with each other. But uh, we do need to get a, a collaboration, I think, from everyone, and uh, including industry, uh, in terms of this uh, very important point about um, how we measure the success or otherwise of their products. Uh, and it's not just the medical outcomes that we're looking at. As patients, we want that quality of life. We want to be able to do things, to join in, to uh, go out and uh, meet people and uh, feel we're part of society. Uh, and uh, so I think if we can get industry to look at that side of their work and to, for their collaboration on the development of digital health, uh, on the this, um, distance monitoring, on, on um, finding the, the different um, patches and um, uh, in, inputs, implants that uh, can be done to help to support the individual in managing his or her own health. And then if you do that, I believe you will ultimately reduce the costs, although I see it as an investment and not a health a cost burden. Other thoughts on this, Stefan, the role of industry and what pharmaceutical groups can and should do more to what they're already doing? Um, I, I think it is clear that obviously they have a strong role in innovation, but of course they are also having a role in uh, ensuring access to all patients um, that, that need those innovations. And uh, indeed, as John says, it's really a question of collaboration and I completely agree with his point that COVID-19 might have the advantage that there is much better understanding that uh, collaboration is needed to address serious health challenges and I hope this can also tr translate uh, in, um, in other areas. That's not only collaboration among uh, companies, but also cooperation between different sectors of government and the European Commission, for example, because I see now that we are, that for example, the, the idea that health actually has an enormous impact also on uh, economic questions. I think this point is really brought home by COVID-19. I mean, we had for the first time this um, enormous EU uh, next generation EU package, which would not have been totally unthinkable be before and it was done uh, because of an economic impact of a health crisis. And uh, I hope very much that this will make it much easier to talk about those people in charge of the, of the economy about health questions in the future. Absolutely. Uh, Siapa, uh, any comment uh, on this question of the role of, of industry, of pharmaceutical companies? What do you want to see from them? Well, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward for this kind of a, a better cooperation between the uh, companies that was mentioned. But then again, and this is a big uphill battle with member states, I think that we should have a stronger role for EU in procuring the medication uh, uh, starting with the rare diseases, but uh, in other uh, diseases uh, also for, for patients. That means that the uh, member states would pay uh, on the EU fund, and the fund itself would uh, then take care of this uh, procurement. The, the reason for this is that now we have very uneven practices on how and what kind of a medication is provided for the patients, depending where they live. And this is not right for the patients. And I understand the interest from the um, uh, uh, pharmaceutical side that they need to, uh, to have the uh, uh, guarantee and understanding 
that uh, if they develop new better uh, medications, they are going to be procured all over the Europe and provided for the patients. And we would need to tr strike a better balance on this uh, regulation and on this attitude uh, <clears throat> uh, in, in Europe. And so I hope that the Commission could put this forward and I'm certain the Parliament is uh, behind there. And then even though it is a big uh, battle with the Council, we should do it. And I hope that the pharmaceuticals and and then the uh, patient organizations could be very active in the member state uh, states level to support that kind of an initiative because now everybody's looking their own cost structures and structures and not willing to move forward and it's unbeneficial for everybody and actually okay we are students. almost out of time but i want to put you all on the spot and see i'll start with you as your oh i was going to say as your camera is back on but can you put it back on again i want to ask each of you we've talked about a lot of issues we've talked about issues around the communication, the narrative, the way people perceive uh, diabetes. We've talked around issues of, of policy and, and reforms to healthcare systems and so on. We've talked about resources. Um, we talked, uh, for example, about the EU for Health programme. Yes, dr drastically cut, uh, but there will be some money, how it would best be used. I want to ask each of you to give me one key next step. So going back to our question that we started this session with about are we doing the best we can for 60 million Europeans living with diabetes, if we want to be able to answer that question, yes, we are doing the best we can, CFO. What for you of all of those issues would be your key priority, the key next thing we need to do? Same question to all of you. I know it's slightly impossible and I'm accepting that this is a complex issue, complex condition as we've discussed so much, but. I'm really looking for a key, concrete key next step to make progress. Sipa. Well, I would organize with the uh, European Parliament's uh, diabetes group, this kind of a team, so whatever meeting, uh, to ask exactly this question of yours, and then try to establish this kind of a multifaceted, multi-party, multi-organization, pharmaceutical patient organizations, uh, <clears throat> understanding to support the EU for health at the finance there, fight for better competencies for, uh, for European Union and the national and EU programs uh, uh, to, to have the content, what, what we've been discussing. Thank you. Thank you. Stefan, I see you smiling wryly. Are you going to take up my challenge? <laughs> And yeah, and, and, and uh, su support actually SILPA, um, because first of all, I want to say we are really super grateful in DG Santé for, for the support in the European Parliament to re-increase the budget of EU for health, and that could really make, that could really make a difference. And um, I would also say that also President von der Leyen said in her speech yesterday uh, that we should think about better health competences for the European Union in the future. So, uh, and we hope that this will be discussed in this uh, planned conference on the future of Europe, that that, that will be a point there, because th that's really a key part of the limitations we are having at the moment. And one practical step uh, I would also like to mention, we, we have now established a new mechanism to transfer best practices from one member states to other member states. And we have a portal for that where everybody, every stakeholder can actually submit practices, they are then assessed for their quality and um, then they are presented to member states. And then if member states are interested in implementing them, we support this implementation process from the EU health program, but also other funding sources. But what we need first, obviously, are good practices. And um, they can be submitted by, as I said, by anybody in this portal. Okay, thank you very much. So let's and I can just invite everybody to do that, to submit such practices, because we are a big laboratory of practices in the European Union, all these different health systems in member states. And we have seen in some areas that very interesting solutions have already been found in some areas of Europe and other areas could benefit from them if they would just be known. And uh, that's a practical step that's yes. possible already Absolutely. today. And you have the portal, please use it, is the plea. Kaisa, briefly, if you would, your key priority, and same to you, John. Yes, well, uh, uh, great point so far. Um, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, but I'm saying this because it's so important, but uh, listen to people living with diabetes. Listen to what they want, acknowledge their expertise, uh, acknowledge them as important equal players in the game. Um, I'm repeating this because it can't be said enough because it's still not happening. So that's, 
Thank you Friends very much. Absolutely. And John, you started with that message too. Is that how you want to end? I, I, well, I want to end by reiterating the, um, the, the quality of life issue. In other words, measure the success of our in, in, uh, interventions in terms of quality of life as well as the medical uh, difference that they make. I want to uh, uh, persuade more and more companies to, and researchers to work together with medical device industry to um, make uh, digital health a reality. Uh, and I want to uh, have a better system of, uh, of screening so that we can identify people at risk of developing or in the pre-diabetes um, category so that they, they can, they, we can apply our best uh, prevention methods to help them. And lastly, I, I want to see better education in schools about mm -hmm. diabetes and I want to see better education of prime ministers. And on that note, thank you very much to all four of you. Thank you for touching on the screening issue. It was a question uh, that also that came from a member of our audience. We didn't have time for all of the questions and some were very detailed uh, and really not, not time to engage with all of them. But thank you so much. I took as many as I could. Thank you so much to Sirpa, to Stefan, to Kaiser and to John for a great discussion. Many issues, much work to be done. But I think we have identified and charted some way forward. So thank you for joining us. Uh, have a very good weekend and stay safe. Goodbye. Thank